Okay, so let's turn the quizzes in. <laughs> Sorry, I, I switched sides. That, that back stairwell is what I did. Okay. Okay. So I uh, as as the semester goes on I got to express my admiration for all of you being here on time at 8 a.m. and dressed in actual clothes. I know, like, for a little while, I guess when I was an uh, undergrad, there was an awful trend of coming to morning classes in the gym. And, uh, and uh, so, I wish that wasn't true. It was horrible, yeah. Okay, so we sort of rushed partway through this little bit on fatigue on Friday. I'm going to revisit it just to make sure everything's clear, and then we'll move on to commercially relevant alloys, and we'll finish up aluminum. Uh, hopefully this week, or maybe just a tiny little bit of overflow on to Monday. Monday, we will, I've, I've gotten the uh, request to go over all the suggested points to ponder. Uh, to spend some time to go through that material, just to sort of an exam review and get what some of the highlights are. So Monday we will do that. Wednesday we'll get a start on brief introduction to steel because no one's going to be paying attention before the exam on Friday. Uh, so we won't do anything too taxing. Too taxing on Wednesday. Okay, so we left off, we were talking about microstructural features that contribute to properties in aluminum alloys. And we made the observation that uh, the increases in fatigue strength has not kept up with our increase in tensile. Uh, strength, right? So we can make stronger and stronger alloys, but we, as we make them stronger, we are not able to make uh, ones that perform as well um, in fatigue. Right? And so if we take a look at the uh, slope here for precipitation hardened alloys is significantly below that for um, right. for non-heat treatable alloys. Right. So the other trend that we see is generally that uh, precipitation strength does not do as well in fatigue as uh, other hardening other hardening mechanisms. Okay. So where do these uh, fatigue cracks start, right? Fatigue initiates from stress concentrations and due to that stress concentration, we get a strain localization, right? And these happen to be mostly from surfaces, right? Either external or internal surfaces. And uh, mostly mechanical notches, corrosion pits, slip bands, in particular, I mentioned that fatigue in H hardened systems uh, is poor. And that's really because we get to uh, localizations, right? The, the same particles that are giving us um, high strength also uh, cause us problems when we uh, experience slip bands. So remember, we've got these, this dispersion of particles. A slip gland is where we 
we will go forward, we'll get plasticity in one direction, we reverse our loading and fatigue, and we get partial reversal along that slip band. It's not complete, right? There's still a small net forward strain on that because nothing, it's, we're not exactly reversible. And then after we go through many cycles, right, we're gonna cut those particles, reduce their area, and some of them are going to uh, dissolve back in or they're going to be basically sheared into two. This gives us a, a spot to accelerate cracking, right? So we get particles that become too small for thermodynamic stability. We have eventually made our particles small enough that we're below our star, right? And they will dissolve back uh, into the matrix, right? And here's just an example. Here's a slip band. And you see that we're new to the particles along the, along the slip band. Yeah. This is a quick question on the curiosity or support. Keeping them essentially smaller than the API. If there's no further age hardening in the GP zone, it's just be consumed. Is there not quite as effective? Yeah, so we'll talk about it when we deal with specific alloys, but normally we don't um, use things just in the GP zone condition, right? We want to age them to get a fine precipitate of other intermediate phases, right? And the GP zones generally are cut fairly easily. So by themselves, remember our time versus hardening curves, we go up and then we get further, much further benefit as we nucleate intermediate phases. Right, so we don't we don't tend to operate um, in a regime where we only have GP things. Okay, so basically the take home message is anything that delocalizes slip will enhance fatigue properties. Right, so the more homogeneous we can make the deformation, the better our alloys are going to do uh, um, in fatigue. Okay, so I. Put up a little example here where we look at alloy 2024, right? So this is the 2000 series, so an aluminum copper age hardening alloy. And we have two versions. We have the standard version and then X, which is high purity. And the higher purity will fail at an earlier <coughs> number of cycles for any uh, stress amplitude. Right? And so now this is where it starts to get confusing. I just said that, that particles can be bad. Here we're saying particles can be good, right? So now we're getting, instead of just the copper phases, right? So if we remove uh, manganese, right? We don't form these, uh, Manganese aluminides, right? And the secondary phase particles give us, uh, in this case, an increased uniformly in slip, right? We said that thermomechanical heat treatments may also result in an increase in, the, in fatigue resistance, right? And basically, depending on the temper, right? So a work hardened. Uh, um, state is going to uh, decrease our our fatigue resistance, right? So basically, we can by uh, keeping our right. So if we if we thermally treat our sample, right? So we remove dislocations and we get a uh, stable precipitate structure, we can increase, right? <coughs> so again, this is, this is sort of confusing. This is why I wanted to, to go through this again. Um, so if we take a look at a, a single case, right? So this is aluminum mag, right? So if we uh, take a look at aluminum magnesium alloy and aluminum magnesium silver, if we just quench these, right, we have uh, 
very good, we have good fatigue resistance, right? We're completely in the solid solution state, right? So we can, um, right, there's no microstructural stress concentrators in our, in our sample, right? However, if we age harden this, right, we are now going to drop our endurance limit, right? Remember our endurance limit is the stress amplitude that we can cycle at with the approximately zero probability of failure, right? So as we age harden, our uh, endurance limit goes down because now we're cutting these fine particles, right? We're nucleating, we're able to, to localize, we're, we have uh, uh, slip bands that are occurring, we're cutting the particles, we're dissolving, we're duct dissolving. But if we then over age, right? If we grow our particles large enough that they can't be cut, right? And now we have to loop, our endurance limit goes back up, right? So we have uh, larger particles forming, right? Okay, and so that's sort of why it's confusing, right? We say particles are good and particles are bad, but it's all a matter of size, how easy it is to cut, and how stable that particular intermetallic or secondary phase particle is going to be in the system. Right, so generally non non soluble intermetallics are going to be better for fatigue, unless of course they get too large and then they become brittle and give us deviations. Right, so there's a sweet spot. Right, and finding that sweet spot is going to be different for each alloy. Right, there's no magic formula, and as we go through the specific commercial alloys, you'll see that some of them have eight or nine different com uh, elements added to try and reduce certain things and play this this complicated trade-off game. Okay, so strain hardening, okay, so work hardening in aluminum alloys, All right, typically for, uh, we, we're thinking about these in non-heat uh, treatable alloys, although there are some tempers, uh, where it's solution heat treated, quenched, and work hardened, either before or after aging. Um, right. So if we take a look at uh, images here from uh, three thousand and three and and fifty fifty two, right? What we see is we get a uh, initial. Um, increase in the uh, yield stress, right? The problem here is that the results that we, we get, if we look at our el percent elongation as a function of cold rolling, we get a big trade-off, we lose ductility, right? So that means that we can't employ strain hardening when we need high levels of ductility and formability, right? We're going to, tr whenever we work hard, we're going to trade off ductility for the uh, increase in the tensile, in the tensile strength. Oddly enough, 3000, this 3003 alloy is really important because it actually gives us better drawing properties in the cold work state than in the annealing condition. Um, and we'll talk about that, but this, this is the alloy that, uh, Beer cancer made from, so a very important, uh, a very important uh, alloy, both from a, a commercial and and scientific uh, point of view, right? Basically, again, this is just another saying the same thing by looking at the the strain hardening rate. In general, aluminum uh, uh, has a very small degree of work hardening. Why is that? Right. High stacking fault. High stacking fault energy. <laughs> locations are close together. Ease of cross slip, right? In which gives us enhanced dynamic recovery rates, right? So we don't work hard in aluminum alloys. Uh, 
right? But if we lower the temperature, if we go to cryogenic temperatures, right, then we can get up, we see up here, if we can suppress, uh, make dislocations harder to, um, to move, make the thermal aspects of dynamic recovery uh, harder, such as climb or veg dislocations, right? Then uh, we really can drop our work hardening rate, right? And this just basically shows the effectiveness of, uh, I mean, we can increase our work hardening rate. This just shows the, the effect of temperature uh, on that, right? But again, the, the effectiveness of strain hardening as a hardening mechanism is going to disappear at these temperatures where dynamic recovery and dynamic recrystallization occur, which for aluminum can be, uh, can be fairly low, right? Okay. So again, as we said, aluminum high, high stacking fault energy, very copious amount of cross slip. We get nice dislocation substructure, right? Easy dynamic recovery and, and recrystallization. The last microstructure feature is that we want to, to hit is texture, right? Whenever we mechanically process a material, we're going to, to create uh, textures, or I should say, whenever we thermally mechanic, thermomechanically process a material, we're going to develop uh, uh, textures, right? So these are, comes from rot rotation associated with plastic deformation, right? If we have a uh, um, rod and bar, we get this extruded fiber texture, right? Which we get the 110 crystallographic plane normals happen to be aligned with our extrusion direction, right? And then we have uh, the other orientations uh, perpendicular to the extrusion axis are randomly, right? So we get an axis symmetric texture with 110 planes parallel. World sheet develops that texture, this weird tube of orientations that I showed in the pole figure, the 111 pole figure um, on the previous thing. Okay. The important thing is when annealed, new grains, so if we deform our take sheet, reduce it by 75 to 95 percent thickness, Right, so we take plate and we roll it out to sheet. Then, when we anneal it, we get very high, uh, what's called the cube texture, which means our little FCC cubes are stacked such that we have a 110 direction normal to the sheet, and we have a 110 direction normally uh, uh, approximately aligned with the rolling direction, right. So we have like we stack little cubes with small degrees of misorientation. So we become more like a single crystal after annealing. We still have grain boundaries. We still have, uh, but there is a strong preference for grains to be oriented that way, as opposed to other. Okay. So the texture is actually really important because of the anisotropy in properties, especially in, in deep drawing. So this is the early stages of uh, um, drawing a uh, beverage can, right? And this is, this is the, sort of the motivating picture for my whole field of research in crystal plasticity, right? This was what uh, industry was really interested in solving, both in aluminum and in steel. When you deep draw, if you start with a random sheet, right, a randomly or a textured material, or a cube and an annealed sheet, you get uh, this earring that comes up. And this is due to the fact that we have a lot of anisotropy in the sheet due to the development of, of texture. Right, so there was a lot of work um, to try and find textures that, when you deform like this, you didn't get this degree of anisotropy that formed. Right, 
And you can imagine if you're uh, someone who makes beer cans, you've got to trim this, right? So that means you need to put a lot more material in each blank. You then have to, so you have to pro, uh, pre-process a whole lot extra material that's going to be cut off and then has to go through a remelt process, right? <laughs> So if you can figure out how to process your material and eliminate this earring, I think the in the, the previous 30 years, the, uh, the average can uses 50% less material uh, in production than, than it did at the, at the start of this, All right? So those are the, the, the rundown of uh, microstructural features that are critical. Um, so let's. Okay, so commercially important alloys and applications. Right. So the, just a reminder of everybody of, I, of the alloy and temper designations. So I, as I was reviewing these notes for today's lectures yesterday, I realized I didn't make the point that uh, the first part of this, we're talking about wrought alloys. We'll talk about cast alloys after the wrought, right? So we'll get to aluminum silicon, and we'll say they're not used for a whole lot, right? But of course, for casting, that's a very important important system, <coughs> right? Yeah. So it up the uh, lecture we were talking about. Oh, okay. So you don't have these notes? Well, so you you uploaded everything, so you, you can uh, we, we can we can find out the files, but not not under modules. Oh, you okay. link them uh, wrong. Oh, okay, okay, I can fix that. That's easy enough to fix. Okay. So. As you find things like that, just shoot me a quick email because those are easy. Those things, those sorts of things, I can fix, right? Um, pretty quickly, right? So remember, we break alloys up basically by uh, the primary uh, alloying, right? And the aluminum association gives them uh, the number designations. Right, and so we'll step through these. Right, um, we talked about this before, but 1000 is commercially pure or higher purity than aluminum, 2000 primarily copper, 3000 manganese, 4000 silicon, 5000 magnesium, 6000 magnesium and silicon, 7000 is zirconium, 8000 is others, and the important one there is lithium, aluminum lithium alloys. Right? Okay. This is just basically, so the, the, the only thing that we have to really remember about the designation is that for the 1000 series, the last two numbers give you the purity, right? So 1145 is 99.45% uh, pure, but Alloy 1200 would be 99.00%, right? In all other series, these digits have very little meaning, right? And just act as a serial number, right? So the alloy designation is just something that's assigned. So, so, however, they do try and keep the second digit as being indicating uh, um, uh, a close relationship, right? So. Five three five two is a derivative of five zero oh, five two, right? And uh, seven four seven five is a derivative of seven zero oh, seven five. 
right? But the third and fourth uh, digits are sort of meaningless. Okay, this is just a different version of the temper, right? You've got the ones from the aluminum alloy, which the aluminum association in the, which I think are a little easier to read that we've already gone over, right? But just to, the important thing to remember is as we go through this is a, H temper is for non heat treatable alloys, right? And that's for strain hardening, right? So the first digit tells you what, uh, what it means. Right. So the confusing one uh, might be this cold work and stabilized. So stabilization is when we just talked about how easy uh, aluminum alloys recover. Right. So if we work hard in them, instead of letting them recover in use, you take them to a higher hardness than what you want in the use case and then give them a very short high temperature heat treatment so that they recover to the use point, right? You're, you're, you're trying to exhaust the driving force for dynamic recovery and end up with an alloy that's at the hardness that you want for the, for the end use case, All right? The second digit gives you in eighths how much work it has received with H8 being called fully hard, which is about a 75% reduction in uh, cross-sectional cross-sectional area right so h1 is one eighth hard it's an odd designation right it's it's right okay h2 all right okay so we this is just more for your reference remember t these are for um precipitate age hardening systems right these are T gives you the heat treatment, right? The most common ones, T4, right? Solution heat treatment quenched and naturally aged, right? Um, T6, solution heat treat quenched and artificially aged, which means we're not aging it at room temperature or service conditions. We're aging it at some elevated temperature artificially in a furnace, right? So T8 is then solution heat treatment quenched cold work followed by artificial aging, so T85 gives us, right, the, the second digit is the percent of cold work, so T85 is, is 5%. There's also um, T3, which is similar to T8, except we do the working after the aging. Right, so, um, but, right, I, I don't expect you guys to Oops. I don't expect every to be able to um, to recall these tempers off the top of your head. So when you're studying for the exam, please don't try and memorize temper designations, right? Especially things like this, the X tempers, which means that they've gone through a stress a stress relieving. So um, after quenching, you can get warping due to residual stress. Right. So basically, the X tempers they we apply a um, stretch to it to relieve that residual stress and help eliminate that that warping. Okay. So on to alloys. So we generally, as we've been talking about, we've been breaking alloys up into age hardenable and non heat treatable alloys. Right. So basically anything that doesn't respond to aging, we're going to call non-heat treatable. And the important ones are the 1000 series or aluminum of very varying degrees of purity, 3000 series, um, and the 5000 series magnesium, and the uh, casting alloys that contain uh, uh, silicon. And so if we look at some of the alloys of interest, right, we see here that we want to pay attention to primarily the mag manganese and magnesium uh, uh, contents, right, as we go through. So these are sort of the block 
the important, the key alloying elements in each of these uh, series. <coughs> and this just gives a different chart of how most of these alloys, what condition they're actually used in, and just the rough estimate of their properties. Right? This is just sort of for reference. Again, don't, <coughs> don't try and memorize anything. Uh, anything off this sh off this sheet. So for non-heat, all right. This is just a over quick quick review of the strain heart of the strengthening mechanisms that we had talked about, all right? So one thousand series aluminum alloys. All right. So our first class. These are typically, mostly we use commercial purity alloys, which means alloys that are 99% uh, aluminum or super purity uh, aluminum, which is four nines or higher. Five nines we generally refer to as crystal bar. So these are, are exceptionally weak mechanically, right? We don't have a lot of strength here. We have nothing to um to hinder dislocations right and these are used primarily in things that are uh, uh for con uh, electrical conductors remember aluminum is second only to copper in terms of application for um electrical conduct right for electrical wires right a lot of the uh Right. Why would aluminum be preferable? Right, its conductivity is lower than copper. No longer wires. Right. It's not. It's lighter. It's it's specific strength. Right is is higher. Right, so we can have something that's lighter for the given strength, but we need a larger cross-sectional area to conduct the current. Right. Which gives you benefits for things like uh, in, uh, electrical systems and aircraft, right? Um, high tension lines, right? You can often get a lighter wire if you take a bigger aluminum conductor with a real thin piece of steel as a structural support than if you did just copper. Uh, um, copper wire, of course, aluminum foil. Right, that's a huge commercial uh, application. And things that are decorative, architectural products, right? Window frames, you know, things that don't need a lot of uh, a lot of strength. Okay. Well, there's our first. The important parts about the first series. Right. So, three thousand series. Uh, manganese is the principal alloying element, right? We have a max solubility of about 1.852. Ah, shoot, I forgot to put down whether this is weight percent or atomic percent. I think it's atomic percent, but I have to check. Um, right? But in general, uh, any alloy of any practical value, we don't want to go about 1.25%. Uh, manganese, and this is because that iron that we can't get rid of very easily, right? But those impurities, the, the effect of the iron is actually to reduce the solub solubility of the manganese content. So, we, if we have too much iron in our system, we're going to precipitate out uh, large particles of manganese alumin aluminide, which is really going to reduce our ductility. And what was the big application for the 3000 series? 3003 was deep drawing for beer cans, for beverage cans, right? And so Anything that's going to reduce ductility makes this a non-useful 
uh, composition for us. So the manganese is, is typically kept around 1% or slightly lower um, because of the impurity that we, the aluminum that we, or the iron impurity that we can't get out, right? Especially in recycling. So the, the biggest, the most important, I would say the only widely used aluminum manganese alloy is 3003 a sheet, right? We get a fine dispersion of manganese containing intermetallics, right? And so we're fairly low tensile strength, right? 110 megapascals versus 90 for commercially pure aluminum, right, in the annealed state. However, we can increase that with work hardening temperatures, with work hardening temp tempers, right, we can almost uh, um, go up to double our, our strength, right, okay. So if we add a little bit of magnesium, right? Basically, magnesium here gives us a it's, a, it's some magic pixie dust, right? Which gives us a little bit more solid solution strengthening, right? Because now we're going to have uh, uh, magnesium uh, particles forming as well. And uh, we actually in can increase our weak crystallization temp by 50, 50 to 60 C, and we end up with a anneal a temp a, a tensile strength in the annealed state of roughly 180 um, 180 MPa. Right. So 3003 is aluminum, manganese, magnesium. Okay. Manganese. Uh, right. So medium strength with high ductility and very good corrosion resistance, right? You don't want your container that you're putting, putting food in to corrode, right, while... Right. So the big thing, beverage cans and roofing sheet because of the ductility and the corrosion resistance. So the 4000 series, this is where I said, remember, we're only talking about wrought alloys here, not cast alloys. All right, so the principal alloying element is silicon. And this is primarily used for welding wires and brazing, right? So if you're TIG welding with aluminum, right, you're going to have a 4000 series alloy of some kind in your... Uh, welding wire, right? And basically the uh, purpose here of the silicon is just to lower the melting point, right? And other than that, as a wrought alloy, uh, aluminum silicon alloys don't have very many applications, right? As a cast alloy, cast alloys, they have a ton, and we'll talk about it. Well, uh, Talk about those uh, towards the end of the week. Okay, so 5000 series, very, very important. So, why did I just? Yeah, okay. I got myself out of order. So, in my head at least, the notes are the notes are in order. It's just me that's out. Uh, so 5000 series, magnesium is the uh, principal alloying element, right? So in the range of, say, slightly less than 1% to 5%, right? And we get a huge range of uh, yield strengths and tensile strengths out of that with the addition of the, magne of, of the magnesium. So from alloy 5000, which is under 1%, we get 
we have a yield strength of 40 MPa, increasing the magnesium content, we get a yield strength up to 160, tensile strengths of 125 and 110. Right, so big changes in the in uh, the strengths. This alloy is nice because it gives us very large uh, ductilities. We can get generally greater than 25% elongation. And we do get some good work hardening uh, behavior out of this. So five, four, five, six. From work hardening, we can raise our yield strength from 160 to 300 MPa. Right, our ultimate tensile strength doesn't increase as much, but even in the work hardened condition, we still get reasonable ductilities, elongations of, of 5% or so. Okay, so what's the big issue with this? Right, we talked about many times is the formation of the beta phase. So if our magnesium content is too high, we form the beta phase, right? And this is going to, to happen primarily at grain boundaries, grain boundary sensitization, right? Remember, we, I, I brought up that the military is very interested in solving this problem because they're having issues with fleets that are at the, the naval vessels that are in <coughs> tropical locations for quite some time. Are now having issues with stress corrosion cracking and structural elements because the temperatures are high enough that you're getting slow growth of the beta phase, right? So the beta phase formation increases with both the amount of strain, the work hardening the material. So you can also nucleate this in slip fans, but or as the the temperature is increased. So these in, in these alloys, we tend to add chromium and manganese, right? Which raise the recrystallization temp and also strengthen the alloys, which allows us to drop the magnesium content a little bit, right? So we can keep similar tensile properties to alloys that contain about 4% magnesium, we can reduce our magnesium to 2.7% 2, 2 and slow the rate of this beta formation, right? And this is, right, how, how is this figured out? A huge amount of trial and error. It's a huge amount of looking at phase diagrams, right? Looking at uh, collections of binary phase diagrams, looking at uh, the ternaries, and trying to just 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 think about come together with with some idea that might work. There isn't any magical formula to a priori decide what this is going to be, right? Now we can do it with tons and tons and tons of ab initio calculation. Right? It's not necessarily any faster, but what it does allow us to do is maybe in the future at least, doing a huge design of experiments where we, where someone says, looking at the phase diagram, I think chromium might be, might be good. So let's do a design of experiments and cast a couple hundred samples where we span the ranges of these compounds, All right? Professor uh, uh, Zhao has a novel way of speeding up those experiments. He's doing uh, diffusion multiples, right? Where he basically will take uh, highly precision machine blocks of the different alloys, of the different elements, stick them together into a big cube, right? Put it in a box and then hip it and laser weld it shut. And then do diffusion experiments, right? Take it out and cut it up. And then, I mean, you can imagine you've got a 
right? If this is aluminum, right? These are different elements. You can look at the, near the corners, right? Look at the compass. Look at look at how much things have been used. Look at the compositions at different regions after diffusing, right? And begin to do alloying that way, right? So basically, you can do your couple hundred uh, experiments in one in one go, right? But it means a lot of characterization work. But keep this in mind, right? Um, there's no there's no magic formula. Everything that we're showing here is a huge amount of trial and error, right? It's someone's PhD thesis, right? To think about how can we reduce magnesium, right? And then spend a whole lot of time, right? Their their advisor may have had the idea that, oh, right, let's try if we do magnesium manganese, right? Those are alloys that exist. But maybe a little bit of chromium because chromium adds a really good corrosion. Uh, uh, corrosion properties, right? Especially uh, uh, when it when it ionizes. Maybe let's try that. And someone then spent five years, right? And they may or may not. They may have shown that. Oh yeah, somewhere around 0.1 percent chromium, we get better properties. Then another person had to come and figure out where around that little window gives us the good properties, but still able to process it, right? So this is a huge amount of work, alloy development, okay? Also, keep in mind for the exam, right? We're going through a lot of alloys here. A lot of this information here is for your reference, right? Because we don't, there isn't like a textbook that lays this, this all out. Right, so there's a lot of alloys listed here because I want you to have a reference for them. Right, I don't expect I will not never ask on the exam how is alloy 5454 different than alloy blah blah blah. Right, so you don't need to memorize compositions. Right, I might ask about 2000 series alloys. Right, right, and to think about a general, or I might say. A general 5,000 series alloy, so then you're going to say, oh, okay, that's aluminum magnesium, probably with these other these other things in it. Okay, so just the last last point to make, right, these, these alloys all will age soften at room temperature, right? So basically that means that we're going to have tensile properties that decrease with time in service, right? And that's going to be primarily due to static recovery in, in the deformed grains. So we have a bunch of H3 tempers, which are commonly used in these alloys. And so H3, as we cold work to a higher degree, we then give it a short heat treatment at slightly elevated temperature to exhaust the cold work, right? This is known as stabilization. And so then we, we can bring our uh, strength values back to where we're interested in using them and that also has a tendency because we've eliminated that cold work right we 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 don't have uh as much of a deformation structure and that's going to reduce the tendency to form the beta phase so we'll stop there for today and uh we'll continue on on wednesday